Thank you. Uh, so hello, VB. Thanks everybody for showing up and staying for the very, 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 very last talk. Um, I promise that it's going to be special, which is my way of saying, the way I've been describing this to some of my friends here is uh, this is either gonna be like pretty nifty or the worst talk I've ever given. And it felt appropriate to kind of go in that direction. So for those of you that don't uh, know me, my name is Juan Andres Herrero Saade, which is why everyone prefers to call me Jags. Um, I, you know, direct research over at Sentinel Labs and Sentinel One and, you know, have been in a bunch of places and do a bunch of things at the same time. But I think more relevant to this particular space um, is to kind of present myself through previous VV presentations. So for those of you uh, who may have seen or may not have seen, uh, for several years, I kind of used Virus Bulletin as a medium to document sort of the development of concepts in the threat intelligence space as such a like nascent industry, sort of coming out of nowhere, most folks doing hardcore technical work and nobody really having the time to sit down and say, this is what we've learned. This is what we can't figure out. This is what's freaking us out right now. This is what's in the horizon. So I actually did five consecutive years of VB papers, um, each one greater in length, later in submission timeline. Um, I actually have to, every time I think about these, I have to express my gratitude to Helen Martin, who uh, you know, never, uh, never shunned me and told me to go away when she had to edit these things. But in particular, I want to kind of bring our attention to sort of Virus Bulletin 2015 in Prague, which was, it was a very special year for me. It was my first VB paper. Uh, first time I was really sort of presenting on these things, obviously kind of nervous about bringing something so conceptual to a technical space. Uh, but it was also particularly special because it was the first time I was on stage for a closing keynote. And it was not my own. It was uh, Kostin Ryus, uh, who is around here somewhere. Uh, thank you, Kostin. Uh, Kostin at the time was, was my boss and very much has been a mentor to me ever since then. And he was kind enough to ask me to come on stage with him and sort of role play for the sake of his presentation. And the question, for those of you that weren't there, the question that was posed was essentially uh, whether you know, in 2015, right after all the Snowden stuff, all the, you know, sort of revelations and things that we were reeling from, uh, whether anti-malware researchers or spies were effectively winning. Like, you know, who's doing better? And I hate to say that, like, the spies won by a mile. Like, it was just um, no contest. In revisiting that eight years later, sort of thinking through that same notion, uh, I think I know better than to ask for your opinion. I think instead we should just admit that cybersecurity has failed. Sort of let that, if it didn't land, it has unequivocally failed. Some things have definitely gotten better. Some things have definitely gotten worse. Uh, but I think that we all seem to have a sort of shared sense uh, that it's an irresolvable problem. In some cases, maybe an unresolvable problem, but that's uh, for other kinds of much smarter people. I don't want to rant too far, but just to kind of give this some kind of body, um, I think a lot of you may relate when we say that, you know, solutions are largely non-transferable, they're, non they're unsustainable, they're unapproachable to most folks. Uh, and in a sense, it's an inevitable byproduct of this insistence on using general purpose computing for everything, right? Like, you want a device that does everything and then you want it to only be able to do certain things. It, you know, doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense on its face. But that's a bit of a cop-out, right? That's saying sort of the underlying fabric of it all is indefensible, so we're never going to be able to do it. Well, then why haven't we been trying, right? Instead, I want to take a look at, you know, just very quickly say, for any of you that I've seen, have had the misfortune of going to RSA recently or the Black Hat Vendor Hall or any of the sort, um, I think you understand what it looks like in the, like, in the investment space for security. 
And the investment space matters, right? Any of you who want to go develop your great idea, um, you can try bootstrapping it, and you'll be much happier if you do, but most chances are you're gonna go try to get some money. And the issue is there's all kinds of simultaneous overhyping, downsizing, a dilution of leadership uh, across a lot of the space, um, a desire for recurring revenue with almost no maintenance, which essentially means that once the product has begun to be sold, there's no need to improve it. We just wanna be able to sell it and keep selling it. Um, at this point, minimum viable product, MVP has become the product for most folks. Um, there's this notion of serial IPOs. Can I IPO my company quickly? Can I then make another company I can IPO as quickly as possible? Like none of those things are um, uh, anything to do with a long lasting security brand. And not to put certain places on the spot, but the notion of charge to store, charge to use business models is entirely antithetical to any idea of security. How can we look at people in the eye and say, keep your logs, check your logs, it'll cost you by how many logs you keep and how many logs you look at. It's ridiculous. I think it's also very hard to make the argument that we need to focus on the product side on infinitely increasing technical capabilities when we have no performance metrics in the space. And for any of you that have had to deal with this, and I promise this isn't a business talk, I just, you know, it, it, the complaints are all around, right? Um, if any of you have had to deal with this at any different stages, the conversation is almost always, you know, trying to increase our technical capabilities, trying to create better tools, more complex tools, more, um, some form of observability that maybe we're not even sure if it's gonna work, but we wanna build it just to see. It's innovation, essentially. Um, at the MVP demo stage, seed stage, it's considered over-engineering. At Series A, it's not a priority. At Series B, we don't have the resources to focus on this right now, maybe in like five or six quarters. Series C, we're catching up on technical debt, we'll get right to that. Um, Series D, not a customer feature request. We have all these customers, they actually don't care whether we have this or not. IPO stage, not relevant to shareholder value. And by market dominance stage, you're just gonna get an, oh, 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 I'm spending quality time with my horses and I will see you next quarter. And that's essentially the life cycle of a company, of a security company. So I think in that sense, we can look at the vendor side of things as one that isn't really going to uh, come and save us, right? I think we all, we all work for some kind of security vendor and we're all doing our best, but I think anybody who's spent enough time in, in any one of these companies, big or small, uh, understands like the real limitations of our humanity and our ability to organize. But I think that there's more reasons for, um, for this sort of general failure state. And this is where I think, oh yeah, my slides are fine. Um, so, one of the reasons that I want to address is actually a matter of, of opacity, which is to say um, specialists from adjacent fields, think of any other kind of specialized field, can't really contribute anything to cybersecurity um, unless they spend maybe five or 10 years learning a new specialty, right? So you're a statistical genius and we say, oh, if you want to say anything over here, take your time, learn IR, learn reversing, learn, learn what all these terms mean before you can say anything um, at the expense of your own field of expertise, or come and say whatever you want and be irredeemably wrong. And I think we've all had that experience, right? You look at some uh, well-meaning USNICS paper by some great academic somewhere, and the underlying foundational understanding of the space is completely wrong. So what value can we take from it? I, I don't know how many of you still read academic papers in computer science and security. If you're not, you're probably not missing out on anything, and that's not a good thing. No field of knowledge develops well in isolation. But as I said, as a result, we can just ignore these external contributions without losing a whole lot. Put in a different way, we're entirely on our own, and it shows. There's a lot of brilliant people here, 
none of us are neurosurgeons, right? I wouldn't, as the smartest person in this room, I would not ask you to take a scalpel to my head, nor should you. But I guess we have to ask sort of why is this the case? Why are we so, um, such an impenetrable field compared to any other ones, right? So uh, for a much better description of some of the gripes and complaints, which are not what I want to focus on today, uh, you can see a, a SummerCon 2022 talk um, about cyber power and cyber war and uh, these sort of illusions that have come up in, in the recent past. Um, and it was what I would call a well-lubricated talk since it's SummerCon, and I said a whole lot more than anyone should probably meaningfully say in any space. Uh, and it probably upset a whole lot of people, right? Especially the folks that, that wrote the cyber power ranking papers and that kind of stuff. But it's not to say anything particularly bad about any particular shop. It's rather to say we're kind of shadow boxing distortions. We're talking about things that don't make sense. The concept of cyber power, absolute cyber power, is inherently nonsensical. We can talk about that. You can watch the talk. We can have a conversation about it. But I want to focus on that fact that we have conceptual distortions that abound in our space as foundational metaphors. And that should worry us particularly, because it means that half the time we're not necessarily dealing with anything meaningful. Uh, so if you want examples of aberrant byproducts, cyber power, cyber deterrence, victims hacking back, the concept of signaling from threat actors, these things don't really mean anything. We inherited deterrence from nuclear discussions. What does it mean to deter or to contain a cyber-enabled country? We're gonna keep the yellow cake from them? Can, can't they just like copy paste it? it? The matter is different, the whole subject is different. These things are unmoored concepts. That said, I'm not saying this is our fault necessarily, it's just our headache to deal with. Our conceptual distortions were inadvertently produced by bureaucracies. In the real nascent time of this whole digital space, because these organizations, these government organizations were trying to wrest control over this new thing that was coming around. And we have inherited the concepts that they crafted in order to try to accomplish that without knowing. And I assure you that we've all used them and it's quite possible that most of you have used at least one of them today. So the notion of a cyber attack or cyber space or cyber domain or CNA, CNO, CNE, CND for all of you sort of like more uh, Western or, or US centric fans. And then there's things like data in transit and data at rest and data in use. And, these are, these are not concepts that make a whole lot of intuitive sense when it comes to what we study and what we work with. They're militaristic concepts. They're concepts that are oddly compatible with signals intelligence agencies or you know, sort of trying to define um, who gets to do what. And it really is, like if you look at the history of sort of these concepts and it, in the 90s, uh, you know, CIA is fighting NSA over whether this is their domain or it's NSA's domain, and then the military wants to be a part of it, but then the DOD, the DOJ, the Pentagon, everybody wants to be a part of it. So is cyber um, like a break-in, or is it like surveillance, or is it SIGINT if the data is not moving? Like, there are discussions that I'm not trying to be cynical about it, I'm just saying if you look at the history of how it developed in the United States, that's where we get a lot of these ideas and we continue to use the terms to this day, now irrelevant of where they came from. <laughs> Domestic and foreign collection, the DIB, things like that. Um, and if you want an actual great study about this, I, I would actually refer to uh, Craig Wiener's uh, PhD dissertation or master's dissertation, uh, which is an excellent a piece of work on this in particular and how cyber is actually an innovation born of the intelligence community, not the military, and that's kind of why we have such a hard time knowing how to, you know, where to place it and what to do with it. But today I actually want to focus on the foundational metaphors themselves because they're, they're insidious, uh, they're subtle, and they're very hard to root out 
It's the things, the sort of images, the allegories, the metaphors, the similes, the comparisons that you put at the very foundation of this thing that you're starting to build. And they inevitably result in a form of sort of subtle conceptual drift. And you can't really remove them and keep the resulting structure, right? You can't, you can't just go and go, oh, well, yeah, this, this foundation is terrible. Let's just sweep it right out from under the house and keep the house. It doesn't work that way. But what we have built doesn't make sense. It definitely doesn't make sense to other branches of knowledge. So how do we start to correct this? And the reality of it is that we can't. Um, so I guess we're screwed, and thank you all for coming. And I would love to just leave it there. It would be such a flex to walk off stage, right? But I think that's the problem, right? We say this is tough, this is hard. This is tough, this is hard, and we leave. Um, but I think we need to kind of try something. We need to at least be able to sort of shake this up a little bit. Um, and we need to replace our foundational metaphors and see what structure emerges, not what structure we get to keep. The idea is deeply uncomfortable, which is why I told you this is either going to be nifty or the worst possible talk you'll ever see. Um, it's, it's actually taken quite a bit to just convince myself that I should move forward with it. Um, we've had some arguments, and I have a lot of people here to thank who've like listened to me rant for the past week. Um, these things are uncomfortable because those metaphors underpin our familiarity with the subject. The minute somebody comes and changes the terms on you, you might be an expert in something, but if anyone's ever dealt with uh, investment bankers, finance is the most opaque thing in the world for no particular reason other than they keep changing the terms and the letters and the acronyms and the words so that you uh, let them manage your investments instead of trying to do it yourself. Um, but we have to admit that if we actually look at the history of cyber, um, this isn't very foreign to us. In the past, I don't know, 70 some years, we've gone from this was calculation, to this was computation, to this was cybernetics, so it was information technology, to information security, and now cybersecurity. And by the next RSA, it'll be something completely different. So maybe it's not that foreign to us to try to just take the whole thing and um, dress it up entirely differently. It is important that our paradigms change, that they evolve, that they adapt, that they degrade. Uh, particularly because the subject of study changes as well, and hopefully we continue to grow and have something else to contribute to it. So what happens if we kind of take some license, right? Let's give ourselves permission to maybe sound silly, maybe go completely off the deep end, um, but what would it take to have like a metaphorical reformulation of cybersecurity? In this day and age, an intentional one. And, um, I take a lot of solace and inspiration from uh, this book Einstein writes in 1916, there's been like 10 editions of it, uh, called on the special and general theory of relativity, or in most cases you'll find it as relativity. What makes the book so great um, is that when Einstein discovers special and general relativity, it was considered such an earth-shattering discovery, such like a mind-bending change that folks thought that it would change humanity's perception of itself and its place in the universe. And I mean, you're talking about a universe with no time. You're talking about the loss of the simultaneous presence. There's so many things that relativity changes uh, that it was almost unfair for it to only be available to physicists and mathematicians and people who could only operate at that level which is something that we do. So Einstein was convinced to produce a popular account. The book actually effectively conveys what special and general theories of relativity are with virtually no math. I believe there's one equation in the entire thing, along with apologies from Einstein for putting it in there. 
And the notion is that anybody with a high school education should be able to pick this book up, read through it, understand it, and hopefully understand you know, how our universe has changed. And the way that Einstein does it is actually something that's much more natural to Einstein's writing than folks would expect, um, is through the use of thought experiments, visualizations, right? You're in, a, you're in an elevator and someone cuts the cable, it falls, can you feel gravity as it's falling? You're riding on a beam of light, traversing the universe, you come close to the sun, the speed changes, presumably, but the speed of light can't change, so what changed? And that's where we get, um, we get sort of this fundamental shift in perspective that changes all of physics and the rest of our world forever. And it can be explained through little drawings and nice stories and things that are intuitive to us, even if the results are counterintuitive. So what Einstein effectively does is to reintroduce the observer into formal physics. It was no longer just full abstraction. Someone was there to look at the thing and the place where they looked from changed the phenomenon, changed the time. And um, the results are super disconcerting, and I promise I'll get away from physics in a second, but the results were disconcerting because they were unimaginable, counterintuitive things that we would never accept just from you know, everyday conversation, and yet they predicted new phenomena with perfect accuracy. So we had this moment where physics was basically saying, what you believe is true, what you feel is true, what you wake up and assume is true, I mean, the math doesn't really take you that way. And we can do new things with this math because we look at it in this way. So in that moment, in the 1920s, you redefined what it meant to have a fabric of space um, and a universal time, right? What does it mean to have a present here and a present in the other side of the galaxy if it's gonna take 4,000 years for you to send me a message about what you're doing at a constant speed of light, then we don't exist in the same present. The present is actually relative to a particular distant, not so distant space. And it's not that foreign. You get on a plane, if you have a um, accurate enough watch, you will see a drift in time just from having traversed that space on a plane compared to somebody that was just on the ground. So it's not, it's not super crazy. It's not that far away, just a little. So let's consider our own humble attempt. How am I on time? Let's see, anyone? Cool, all right. So what would be the basis for a metaphorical reformulation of cybersecurity? We're gonna work with just these two principles. We're gonna avoid and discard any existing terms as much as possible. Some things are inevitable, right? You can't just completely make everything out of whole cloth, but let's avoid you know, the terms of art that we've gotten used to in the industry. And the one guiding axiom that I would like us to use just for today is the notion of perfect information, assumed perfect information. And that's really important because the entirety of our space in its current formulation is defined by information asymmetry, the opposite of perfect information. The notion being, I don't know what you know, and you don't know what I know, and a lot of the battle here is me trying to find out what you know and trying to keep what I know from you. That's the fundamental dynamic of everything we do here as far as privacy and security is concerned. It's a matter of information asymmetry, the same way that intelligence has been a matter of information asymmetry for, you know, times eternal. Bring it closer to home, right? Defender doesn't fully know what the attacker's intent means, capabilities, and goals are at any given time. The attacker doesn't fully know what the defender's intent means, capabilities, and goals are, though most of the time they know better than we do. Um, and to put us back in there, threat intelligence is essentially an approximate response to asymmetry. When people say, well, why do I need threat intel? Well, depending on your level of maturity, you probably don't, but once you get to a certain place where you can action on it, it would be nice to know what that attacker has been doing in other relevant spaces and how they did it, and you can, you know, you can work off of that. It's a crib sheet, it's spark notes, um, in a sense, 
uh, for the rich and the mature organizations that can do something with it. And then for you know, journalists to have fun with. So what would our phenomena, our subject of study look like in terms of perfect information? This is where I go completely off the rails. Like this is where we lose all sense of uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, so let's think about a data array. And by that, I mean like our most basic node in this system. And you can picture it as sort of like a stick of RAM, right? It has a, um, it has a definite size. It's limited in some ways. Um, the data exists in some configuration or state at any given time. Even if you, you know, take the electricity away from a stick of RAM, it's still all zeros, right? It's a given state. Um, it can be arranged into any, you know, into a finite number of ordered states. And an ordered state converts data into information. We're just putting premises in place, right? The distinction between data and information is important. All information is in some way data but not all data is information, and what distinguishes that is order. In order for information to be information, there has to be some kind of sense-making protocol, which is, you know, think about getting a, uh, a, an encrypted blob and not being told what cryptographic algorithm or what password, and just, you just stare at it, right? Presumably there's information somewhere in there, but that order is not something we're privy to. The properties of information are particularly important, right? If we are in involved in some kind of information security, we should perhaps be a little more acquainted with what makes information. Uh, this is where the deterrence analogy falls entirely on its face, or really the containment analogy, but we call it deterrence. Information as the most basic unit of matter and what we work with is nothing like physical matter. It is infinitely reproducible, but destructible. That's why I can't keep you from having, you know, from cloning your GitHub cyber weapons 100,000 times. And none of us lose it. If I give it to you, I still have it and you still have it. Um, order relative to a data array can be established, it can be degraded, right? You know, we do have such things as data loss and corruption and whatnot. Uh, but also, I can give you a copy of something and then sort of do away with my version of it, um, which also means information doesn't move from one data array to another. Information transfer is essentially a successful replication of order. You already had a data array of a certain size. I told you how to organize the information there. It's order. I mentioned sense-making protocols. Um, this is really a convenient abstraction for me not to have to redefine every kind of transformation we do on data, but I think it's also valuable, right? Uh, the idea is, they're abstractions for covering the entirety of the creation, replication, transformation of information between two or more data arrays. It's like a big cop-out for me. Uh, they can be layered together. Successful transfer of information is measured entirely by the state of the information on one end and the other. Think of it as Tor. You're on one end of a, tor like of a, of a whole Tor circuit. I'm on the other. I put a piece of information into it, it gets transformed, layered, covered, encrypted, changed, gets to a place, gets decrypted, <laughs> sent back, changed, et cetera, 100,000 times for all that matters. But what makes it a successful transfer of information is that it came in one end and it came out the other end making sense. And most of the time we don't even know where it went or how it went from one point to the other. It also lets us do things like account for compression and lossy algorithms, right? Like if you take a song that's four gigs and I can turn it into an MP3 that's four megs and you still can make sense of it, <coughs> still information. And I swear this is sort of like the last bit of this sort of very convoluted approach going off the deep end. We're gonna think about meta circuits or small systems is what you might normally call them. And the idea being any two or more nodes, any two or more data arrays establishes a meta circuit. A meta circuit, a member of a meta circuit is not necessarily aware of non-adjacent members of that circuit. So you don't know everybody that was engaged in the same information transfer. You might just know the folks that are directly adjacent to you, sort of a conical view. 
These members are finite and they're mutable. And membership in a circuit defines sort of a party that can be recognized as an observer, which is where we've come back to what we do. But just to kind of make this a little more palatable, right? When you are contacting something on the internet, it, the idea, we talk about the internet um, as if it is some homogenous thing that exists in and of itself. It, it, it is anything but that. And most of the people in this room would know that better than most other people, right? You go from your computer, to, which has an OS probably maintained by somebody that has more access than you would ever like, through a browser that also does that, uh, to a router that you don't maintain, to an ISP that you have zero visibility into, God knows what those circuits look like in there, goes to a VPS of some sort that may move it to another VPS at a different provider that might move it to another ISP somewhere that might get it to another endpoint. There's no notion of sort of what all got carried there. And knowing the mutable nature of the internet, the next time you do that, it may not take the same course, but you'll get the same result. This is sort of magnificent, horrendous piece of like Mac MacGyvering that we've done. The notion of observability is kind of where I think I start to land the plane somewhere intelligible again. Um, and the notion being an observer is defined by the access to the information that's in that circuit, but also the ability to produce meta information on the basis of that. In order to be an observer, you have to be part of a relevant circuit. A data array is not implicitly an observer, but an observer constitutes a data array that has to be able to carry more than what it sees. All possible observability is quantifiable byproduct of knowledge. What the hell does that mean? I'm basically saying, um, that in some ways, if we look at it like this, we could actually, in a perfect information space, have a conversation about all that is possibly observable in a circuit. And that's something that is very foreign to us in Threat Intel, right? When we sit down and we go, there was an attack. It went from here to there to there and there and there. Uh, well, we don't know the constituent elements, right? But if we ever know anything about an attack, it's because an observer somewhere along that line noticed that something happened. They retained information, they analyzed information, created meta information on that and said, within the conical view of my tiny slice of this thing, something has happened that wasn't supposed to happen. And I happen to have some fossilized sense of what that was. And this frustrates me deeply, right? Like I think about all the um, malware uh, corpuses that have just been thrown into the ether because the cost of storage was too high. And like things will never get back, right? Kind of stuff drives me crazy. To be an observer, you have to be part of your circuit. Um, there's all these ways in which we sort of kind of define this view. Now, why do we do that? Where are our insights? Why is this valuable at all, finally, right? When you start to look at it in this way, we talk about observability as something quantifiable. It also essentially allows us to put this notion of attackers and defenders into the same type of entity. And I think that's really important because for some time, attackers have been playing this like multi-dimensional chess game and we are stuck dealing with our tiny playground somewhere along the way and it's never made any sense. I mean, if you, if you think about a really complex espionage operation with a very capable adversary, and I go, well, I'm the best endpoint defender on Earth, so no one's gonna get that information out of this endpoint. Sure, they go, no, no, that's great, but we're sitting right on that router in the middle of the whole thing, and we're gonna get it anyways. So it's great that you've had such a hardened target on one end, but it doesn't meaningfully do anything. It's why like the TAO catalog was such a like, fun and frustrating thing to read through. Right, it's like, well, okay, yeah, we're doing great things on the software end, but they're watching the monitor. <laughs> There's so many side channel attacks, so many different things you can put in there. And I think in many ways, sort of our defensive stance has been limited by this notion that we have a very specific part of a chain and the chain is undefined and it doesn't matter. Um, we just do our job in this one little space, which is what makes the whole thing a failed endeavor from start to end. 
I can be great at this part, you can be great at that part, and we don't care what happens in the middle. Because it's not cyber. The opportunities for espionage, sabotage, modification are finite. They're relatively predictable to some extent. That is what amazing intelligence, like top tier intelligence agencies do. They look at the whole map and go, why would we bother going here when we can go there and get everything? It's brilliant. You have to love them for how good they are at what they do. Um, but redefining our terms in this way, in terms of information assurance, information defense, perfect information asymmetry, so on, actually allows us to do something that I think is really important. A, it does away with the notion that privacy and security exist by default. That it's an idea that maybe, you know, in Europe in particular, not that this is Europe anymore, um, <laughs> that might be uh, violating a sacrosanct concept, but uh, talking to OS, like security architects at very important companies, there's this notion of like, well, if we, uh, look at what our customers are doing, we're violating their privacy. If you're looking at what your customers are doing to know if anybody else is looking at what their, your customers are doing, there is no privacy to preserve in the first place. There is no, privacy does not inherently exist. It is produced, it is maintained, it is created, if it's at all possible at this point. And the same goes with security in many ways. More importantly, I think when you look at it in these terms, we can once again get back to a form of sanity where you say that cyber as a standalone phenomenon, as a mechanism, as an activity, as a delimited operation, as a domain of operation, domain of warfare, whatever the hell you want to call it, it disappears. It doesn't actually exist. What, when you're trying to protect information in this way, what does it mean to focus on a slice of it that is only cyber? So while we may feel a bit lost in this notion, it actually represents the other entities involved in this activity with a much higher sense of fidelity. Intelligence agencies go by whatever means necessary. Criminals go by whatever means necessary. They don't focus on their very delimited lane. So I think, yeah, I'm pretty well on time, but um, I did want to leave a series of open questions because I haven't figured out anything. I'm just trying to kind of put this different map and say, hey, does anybody see something different than me? And I would be thrilled for somebody to come down the mountain from like information theory and say, you're an idiot. Claude Shannon figured out that information actually moves in this way, not that way. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I would love to see. I want to know where our intuitions are wrong in a way that comes from specialized knowledge in other places or smarter people who've done other things. So if you do get really wrapped up in this, and I promise to publish something that maybe is a little more intelligible and maybe not, um, we can talk about you know, how, what, time, what role time can actually play and what does it mean to have duration of an attack, duration of an operation, simultaneity in this, like things that don't mean a whole lot. Uh, to what extent we can sort of fold in physical properties as the underlying constituents of these nodes, uh, because we have to, right? Side channel attacks are a form of sense making that is deeply frustrating to us, but it's there, right? Rohammer taught us a great deal. What does it mean to have entropy in our space to whatever extent that's valuable as a function of time? Um, but most importantly, how much of our current subject of study is a distortion created by the blurring, inherent and ungrounded and inexact observation? How much of what we talk about, the attack chain, the kill chain, the phases of espionage, are just things that we see from this very blurry view of a conical view that only we, I have here and you don't have over there that is ex that's inherently inexact. Because we're not dealing with exactitude and we can't, but we're definitely not in a place where we can sort of fan ourselves for how precise we're being in our work. And the perspective value is exactly what I started with here, right? The point being, this room doesn't have the solutions. I certainly, am nowhere near a solution of anything, but I would certainly hope that if we can make this more approachable, more meaningful, that our friends from information theory and control theory and folks that work on dynamic systems and folks that work on um, complex adaptive systems and statistics and applied mathematics and all the folks that we can't really understand um, will somehow have something for us that is meaningful enough to pay attention to. 
Um, so I promise to, to have something with actual illustrations and whatnot, and I'm hoping that I can leave a minute or two for somebody to like throw an egg my way. Uh, but real quick, I did want to say thank you to everybody who had the misfortune of listening to a very early draft of this, um, and now really say questions.